Welcome everyone to Encyclopod, the Encyclopocalypse, yeah, I can't even talk, Encyclopocalypse Publications Podcast. See, even I get tripped up on our own name. So it's not my fault. Blame uh, founder Mark Allen Miller. He thought of the name and um, he stuck with it. <laughs> I'm Sean DeRager. I am the managing editor of, Encycl- of, of Encyclopocalypse Publications. Uh, excited about today. Bit jittery, new podcast thing going live to who knows how many people. You know, five people maybe. Um, but excited excited to do this. I've been wanting to do this for quite some time. I was host of a podcast called The Screamcast for a while with Brad Henderson, uh, Stephanie Crawford, uh, Mike Delaney, as well as BJ Colangelo was a part of it as well. So been itching to do something and uh, figured might as well do something for Encyclopocalypse. I do, I spend enough of my time with the publisher, so figured I would do something like this to help bring in our authors and creators and uh, as well as what I want to do is have other publishers on and we can talk shop and kind of get a behind the curtain look at uh, what a publisher does. Today on uh, the show, uh, I'm very excited uh, to introduce Vincenzo Natali. He's been a favorite director of mine for quite some time. Um, I initially caught Cube like probably everyone else, you know, my age and into horror and um, that you know, blew my mind, and then he came out, you know, with Splice, and that movie, um, that's a good one. That's probably one of my all-time favorite um, kind of sci-fi horror, um, you know, it's it's so good. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, his, his career, but the thing we're here for is to talk about his debut graphic novel, Tech, which he uh, he created all on his own, which is unheard of, I think. In, uh, in graphic novels, usually there's a team of artists and all this stuff. So um, I'm going to bring him on, and we are going to talk to Vincenzo Natali. Hey, Vincenzo. Hey, Encyclopocalypse, hey, Encyclopocalypse, Encyclopocalypse, Encyclopocalypse. Yeah. yeah all, you <laughs> I know. love that name. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things that I think uh, I think Mark's wife said, you got to change the name. And he was like, I can't. Um, we're in. We're in too deep. So No, I love it. You know. It's fantastic. I mean, you know. Part of the, part of this is to help everyone be able to pronounce it properly now. Now that people can <laughs> they can watch the the show, they can listen to the podcast. They'll go, oh, that's how you pronounce Encyclopocalypse. Yeah. So exactly. very excited to have you on. Um, it's funny. I, I initially reached out to you uh, via Twitter, now called X, and um, just out of the blue because I was kind of you know fishing for novelization ideas and trying to get some. You know, seeing what's what's out there, what rights were available, and at being a fan of Cube and a fan of Splice, especially, I just on a whim reached out to you, and you were kind enough to uh, respond back. So, and thus began this uh, crazy journey. So I get these uh, novelizations going, and we're kind of you know casting uh, authors, we're kind of trying to find authors. Got that done, and then Mark uh, tells me uh, that you have a graphic novel. And uh, at first, I was very nervous because we hadn't at the time uh, had any experience with the graphic novels. And uh, we, we eventually, Werewolf came um, by Robert Sacato came uh, to pass. But you know, you had this um, beautiful graphic novel called Tech that I had a PDF of, and was uh, looking through and very excited to get going on it. And uh, just I think it turned out wonderfully. Uh, it's just a fantastic story and you know, sci-fi mixed with a little bit of the ultra violence is my jam. But plus there's a very uh, a fantastic story about um, motherhood in many ways uh, with with this graphic novel. So um, welcome to the show and thanks for talking to me. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, it's this dream working with you guys. I love it. <laughs> and that's funny. Whenever you say that, I'm like, oh, no, come on. We can't be that great. Um, but it's, it's always uh, the but working you are. relationship you are. has been wonderful. So it's been so nice. And I know what a bad relationship's like. So <laughs> I've seen the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you're as lucky. as do lucky. as do many people, I think, in the creative field. We all kind of experience that every now and then. But um, so the I wanted to start this conversation off with uh, we'll touch base with the novelizations later. I got some news on those. We'll tell everybody where those are at. But um the the first thing I wanted to talk about, of course, was this graphic novel. And um, I had sent your mama a, a complimentary copy. She tried to buy one and was paying like 50 bucks shipping because I kept the international shipping high because I hadn't figured things out yet. And it's Canada. Now I know how much Canada uh, shipping is. I'll be redoing the website to, to incorporate all that. But 
you know, she she pays, you know, she pays, you know, what, what, 32 bucks for the graphic novel and 50 bucks for shipping. And I was like, you know, and uh, turned out it was your it was your mom. So I was like, no, 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 we canceled that order. And I sent her a complimentary co copy and she sent me this amazing email just saying that this you know i made the dreams of a four-year-old come true <laughs> so Some, mentally i wanted to start yeah. there uh, i wanted to start start there kind of um you know you as a creative kind of growing up moving into you know moving into the film industry putting out some incredible work um but then having this idea of tech in your in your head and wanting to get that out somehow um so i wanted to give you the floor to elaborate on that yeah sure well I, i'm sort of a failed comic book artist um <laughs> i ended up making movies and you know working in television but my first love was comic books growing up and that really was the most exciting thing i'm of a, a certain vintage and um in a pre-star wars world for a little kid there wasn't a lot that uh was made for us and there wasn't a lot a visual kind of narrative storytelling that was really exciting. Um, there were great books, you know, there were there was the Lord of the Rings, for instance, many other things of that nature. But um, uh, but in movie theaters and on television, it, it was skewed towards kids. It was more for adults. So um, comic books were where I escaped as a kid. And I really, I, since an early age, I always loved to draw um and and have continued to do so and um you know at a certain point my interest did shift to movies but i never stopped drawing and and a big part of the filmmaking process for me is drawing because i always storyboard my films um and tv shows everything i do i kind of almost have to it's like a, a nervous mm -hmm. tick i can't go on set without my storyboards um they're my security blanket and uh, so I have, and a storyboard for anyone who doesn't know is, is effectively like a comic book. It's, you know, uh, panels, drawings of each shot in the sequence that you're going to shoot and much like comic book panels. And, um, I don't know if I'm a particularly good artist, but I am fast and, <laughs> and I have sort of came to the realization that, well, you know, I, I think I could do a comic. I think I, I just have like this, the speed to do it. So why not give it a shot? And um, concurrent to that, Apple came out with the iPad Pro. And that was the first tablet where you could actually draw on the screen. And when I realized what that was capable of, that I could pencil it, that I could ink it, that I could color it, that I could do all of the layout and the lettering, everything on this one little device all by myself, that, that was really the kind of green light for me to jump into it. And, and, um, and it was lovely because I'm used to working in film where it's, you're always pushing a boulder up a hill to get anything right. made. It's an incredibly slow process. It involves a lot of people. Um, it's very expensive. It involves a lot of money. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of politics involved in just getting anything made and in making and in finishing and everything. So it's a, it's a wonderful medium, the best medium in my opinion, but there's a price to be paid for that. It's not easy. And, you know, invariably what you learn as a director is how to art, artfully compromise mm -hmm. because it's always about working around the exigencies of reality. You know, you go to shoot a sunny scene and there's clouds and you have to not fight against that. You have to incorporate. So, um, uh, so I'm used to existing in that kind of world. When I sat down to do tech, it was just me. <laughs> there was, it was almost, I was almost uncomfortable with the fact that like I had total creative freedom, both in terms of, <laughs> you know, what I wanted to put on the page, like not having anybody comment on it or, you know, put their stamp on it or, you know, or be concerned, afraid of it for some reason. Um, and also not, there were no restrictions in terms of cost or, mm -hmm. you know, any kind of the physical technical challenges that one has when making a film. So it was actually like this amazingly rejuvenating, liberating experience 
um, because it's still at the end of the day, comics are visual narrative storytelling. They're very yeah. closely related to film. So that was my journey from four to 54. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I love that you were able to kind of just play in your own sandbox um, because like like you said, you know, the collaborative nature of filmmaking, um, you know, is full of compromise. And, you know, not just from the creative standpoint with working with, you know, everyone, everyone else involved in the film, but then you also have, in some cases, studio pressure of, you know, Re rewrite oh change this change that someone there's always somebody trying to change the the story um away from you know sometimes away from the writer or the filmmaker's vision uh, i was speaking with an author who they had a film optioned and or a tv series optioned and the studio changed the entire book changed the the main character um the her motivations and you know, sure, the author was going to get an executive, you know, producer credit possibly, or you know, he got, you know, made the money, got the money for for development. But for me, like, you know, as as a creative myself, like, I don't, I don't know how I would react in that sort of situation. So it always, um, it's always, it's always nice to, it's nice to hear that you were able to operate in that because that's it's so much different from your from your day to day because you're involved in so many different projects, television film um and i mean you had the freedom right i mean it was during you started during uh during COVID happened lockdowns happened all that stuff was that did that open you up to do this and then um what was what was the downsides to being a possible downside to kind of being your own <laughs> you have no one else to answer to <laughs> No downside whatsoever, as far as I was <laughs> concerned. I mean, I didn't know if I was doing anything good, but in a way that, that in itself was freeing. Like I didn't have right. the weight of expectation, you know, because I was, even though I've always drawn and I have drawn professionally as a storyboard artist, um, I wasn't out to prove myself as a brilliant comic book artist or anything. I was really doing it for mm -hmm. the pleasure of it more yeah. than anything. And, and so it was just this amazingly freeing, exuberant experience, which I hope translates on the page. Like I, I hope that mm -hmm. some of that joy is kind of visible in, in the storytelling and the illustration. And, um, and you're right, COVID, as horrible and tragic as it was for the world, was actually kind of great for mm -hmm. me because it, it permitted me to finish the comic. So I had been, right. I think I started this about five years ago. And I would just work on it in between film or TV projects when I had some downtime. Um, but it was a very lengthy process. And actually, it was interesting because I did it on my iPad and I used a, a particular drawing painting program called Procreate. I discovered after the fact that each page that I had, uh, the program recorded how long it took me to do it. Oh, wow. And and so I was actually able to calculate with a fair amount of accuracy exactly how long it took me to do the comic. And um, it turned out that I would average somewhere between, or it would, it would be about between 10 to 14 hours for a page for me to like pencil it, paint it, everything, ink it, whole thing. Um, and there's close to 200 pages in the book. And I think it took me about, and the book is divided into three parts. And I think it, mm -hmm. it probably took me about a month to write and thumbnail each part. So that's more or less, if I took the weekends off, but was working 10 to 14 hour days, that's a year. So that's yeah. really how long, if I just sat down and started yeah. in January 1st, I would have finished, you know, December 31st. And, um, and that would have been the comic book, but that was of course spread between a lot of other steps. So it actually ended up taking five years. Wow. Um, I wanted to kind of, set up the the plot for for everyone you know who hasn't hasn't read the synopsis or you know just hearing about this for the first time um what's kind of the the the, the main synopsis you would give to somebody who is you're just hearing you talk about this well you know i never had to pitch it <laughs> that's funny <laughs> so i don't know this might be a little bit rough but essentially this is a story about what if you know, one of those SETI 
satellites received a signal from outer space, some kind of coded signal. And when we, as humans, started to crack the code, what we realized is the code was to build some kind of technology. We don't even really know what, but you know, we start to print it like you 3D print stuff. We start to build this, these things and, and discover that these modules, which is what they're called, do amazing stuff, all kinds of things. And they can be used in different ways, um, but there's no instruction kit. We're just getting this stuff. Uh, that's the background to our story. What really interested me about that concept was what would people, what would humans do if they got their hands on this amazing alien technology? And, and the cynic in me could not help but think <laughs> we, <laughs> we would probably find a way to make money off of it. We would commodify it. And, yeah. and so the idea of there being the alien technology being commodified and that there would invariably be some kind of black market that would then spring up as a result of that, you know, people who would steal the stuff online and build their own versions of it. And, and so tech posits a world where there's this very robust criminal element that is taking the stuff and they're turning into all kinds of things, including drugs. Mm -hmm. So people are literally smoking <laughs> alien technology and it's doing crazy things to them. And it's like an epidemic. And, and so in this sort of messed up world, we find our main character, Shell, who is a young woman who effectively is a courier for this stuff. Like she has an, she's grown up with it. It's been around a lot long enough that she's grown up with it. And so she has this almost sixth sense for the modules and being able to identify them and kind of know what to do with them and so on. Um, and that's all fine, but she at one point in this, in her career, uh, got pregnant and she had a kid and the kid has issues, physical issues, which are almost certainly a result of her exposure to the modules because the modules do affect, if you spend it like, they radiate something. So if you get to spend too much time with them, they actually deteriorate you at a cellular level. So she has this tremendous conflict in her life because on one hand, she feels like she has to do protect her child and she desperately wants to get out of this criminal world that she's stuck in. But the only way she can save her child to pay her medical bills is to work in the criminal world. Um, and then of course she feels tremendous guilt about it. So, so uh, there's a lot going on. It's about her negotiating her way through this criminal world. There's a, a she gets involved in a very big heist of a very particular, uh, particularly potent and uh, important module. And then it's about her trying to reconnect with her daughter. Mm -hmm. So that's like a five paragraph pitch. <laughs> That's yeah, no, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's better. It's better than I can do. I, on the on the screencast, I I would always try to tell everyone what a movie's about, and I would fail horribly. So, yeah, I think you did better than I. That's that's not an elevator pitch. That's like a, uh, <laughs> an airplane pitch. Yeah, I uh, I love the character of of shell of shell, and you know I've, I've noticed, you know you've done you know you've done sci-fi in the past. Cipher uh, is a film that you've done. Uh, uh, there's a woman lead, woman lead character there. Um, Splice, although it's everyone assumes, kind of looks at Adrian Brody as the main character. Uh, it's Sarah Polly, right? Was Sarah Polly the yeah. the actress? Um, her character also has um, is, is a lot going on as well. Um, and then I was even just watching because uh, because Mark brought it up and I just threw it on uh, in the tall grass uh, the other night. I know you didn't write that, but it was a Stephen King. Oh, I did. Um, oh, you yeah, did you write the original material, but I yeah, 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 yeah. You adapted it. Um, yeah. And then with Shell as as, as a lead character there, um, uh, Splice uh, in the tall grass, and then and then Tech do have kind of a you know, connection with motherhood, um, but, but a strong woman mm. character, what, what kind of leads you to writing, you know, these women characters as opposed to, oh, I'm going to do a sci-fi film with this, you know, tough guy, you know, uh, whatever, what, cause I noticed, uh, I, I like it when, when, yeah. when, uh, male authors, uh, can do that well, cause a lot try and can't, but I think you're one of them that does it very well. Um, what, guide you to kind of these characters and even the theme of motherhood um 
that has been into, uh, into a few of your films? I was brought up by my mom. I have a very nice mother, <laughs> as, you, as you were just saying. So I'm sure that has a lot to do with it. And then, and um, you know, I I think it's just because until recently, and of course things have changed quite dramatically in the last five years, we just didn't see a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, and in the case of Splice, like I don't think the women are always great. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, Sarah Polly Splice is full of very flawed complicated... characters. Yeah, <laughs> no... <laughs> it's full of flawed characters. She's a very, but I think she is the protagonist more than Adrian Brody's character. Um, uh, it is more Sarah or El her character Elsa's story, and she's a complicated woman, um, but mm -hmm. it's very interesting for that reason. And and I think in that sort of genre space, I always want to mutate the genre. I'm just because I consume yeah. it a lot. I I don't want to just repeat things that I've seen. I'm I'm very, you know, dedicated to trying to do something a little bit new and push it in a slightly new direction. So I th I think that's partly it. And then, you know, I guess I have a very healthy dislike, distaste for toxic masculinity. So, <laughs> you know, uh, it's maybe a bit of a reaction to that. And uh, I don't like guns in my <laughs> movies. Like Shell, there are guns in, in tech that is quite violent, but Shell doesn't really use a gun. I'm not, right. you know, I think uh, I like, and they're smart. I'll tell you, that's what all is common to all of these yeah. female characters. They're really smart. So they're interesting. And yeah, anyway, that, I, that's as much self analysis as I would probably do. Probably, it mostly has to do with my mom. <laughs> but I was, you know, I must say, like, uh, Shell is black too, and I was that was a a very conscious, de direct reaction to Trump, because when I started, mm. I started tech in 2016, I think, if I remember correctly, and I was like, I <laughs> Trump got like, I was like, my main character is going to be a black woman. I'm so angry <laughs> about that whole situation. Um, yeah, and uh, so that yeah, so I think that's you know also plays a role in it all. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, I, I love, I do love the way you mentioned playing with genre, playing with stereotypes, playing with, with all of that. And, and that's, I think that's the one thing that I gravitate towards, you know, your work is because I know that if, if I'm going to watch something that Vincenzo Natale is a part of, I, it's going to be turned on its head. It's going to be something, you know, different than I'm normally seeing. I'm going to be surprised. Um, and interested the entire way through. I feel like, like I said, just it's just because it's fresh in my mind, um, the tall grass uh, in the tall grass that that movie, when I first saw it, I was just kind of riveted. I was like, where is this thing going? And um, it <laughs> oh, does thanks. a great job of just stringing the viewer along because at first I was like, man, I don't know if I want to watch this because I'm feeling very claustrophobic because um, at first it feels like, almost like a stage play, very, you know, one location um, type story. And then you start, you know, you're pulling the thread and you realize there's more going on. Uh, Cube is very much the same way. You're, you know, you're, you're, you think, oh, you know, this is a small scale science fiction. But uh, as you start going through, you're realizing there's more, you know, more to, to as you go through all the, peel the layers away. Um, and I feel like that's, that's the case with, with, uh, with everything that I think that I've seen you do, um, you know, there, there's, you know, that you, you know, that you're never, you're never gonna just, you're not, not just writing to cut a paycheck. Like there's, there are, <laughs> you know, there is, you know, uh, we're moving in the streaming space and everything in where these studios are talking, you know, they're wanting content, they're wanting IP. Um, and, you know, and I feel like you can pump out IP, but I feel like true creatives, you know, I, I know that I know that everyone is not happy about that. But I know that, you know, at the end of the day, you need to make a living and, you know, people need to make you know, compromises and concessions. Um, how do you balance this um, this kind of push and pull of like studio system? I mean, you, you did Cabinet of Curiosities um, uh for or netflix um you were brought on board to do an episode of that you've done the peripheral which you know to my dismay uh and ultimate sadness was was you know was canceled by amazon prime after the first season after this cliffhanger <laughs> right <laughs> um 
<laughs> but how do you how do you juggle that? Because I know because this is your livelihood. You know, you we all we all can't just, you know, I mean, if, if I had my say, I would just do this, you know, every day. This publisher, I would do that. But I but I don't. There's other things that I do that I don't like to do, but I got to work and do that, you know, to provide provide mm -hmm. for the family. How how do you um I guess we all don't know how we do it, but what, how do you, I guess, how do you in, in the best sense juggle, you know, that the creative with the, you know, the IP, you know, in, in a sense, you know, right. to, to keep going in this, in this field. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> I would have made a lot more movies, but for the fact that I, 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 it's very hard for me to work on something that I don't care about. It's too much work. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, it's so, yeah. But I have, you know, I've done journeyman work in the TV space. Like I, right. I went into TV because it was becoming for me very, very difficult to survive as a feature filmmaker. And I had a family and, you know, I was responsible to more than just myself at that point. And so I went in there with like these, you know, they had to do like, well, I, I have, to, I just need to work. I just got super lucky because I, fell into the auspices of Brian Fuller and I worked on Hannibal mm -hmm. and then that opened up this whole world and it just happened to be a time when TV in fact was maybe a little bit more interesting than film was at least made right. in the mainstream in the mainstream yeah. and and there was and there was a lot less creative oversight from the studios or the networks and so on um so ironically <laughs> in my attempt to become a journeyman director I actually got to work on some very interesting stuff. And I always made it my uh, objective to put as much of myself, invest as much of myself and work as hard on those shows, which were not mine, um, and do them as though they, but but put as much work into them as, as if they were mine. And, mm -hmm. and that actually ended up being not just a way to survive, but I, I found it kind of creatively rejuvenating. Um, so uh, I was lucky. I think I, yeah. I have only managed to survive because of that. And, um, uh, and you know, Guillermo del Toro said a very true thing to me. He had made a great observation. He said, filmmakers always look forward and studios always look back. And they always look backwards. They're always looking at the what used to, you know, what has succeeded. Yeah. And filmmakers are always, of course, wanting to, or creative people want to do something new. And that, I feel like that's the central schism in, in this industry. And I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling that way. That's, that's the biggest hurdle that I've had to jump over is like, well, how do I get someone to give me millions of dollars, get risk a lot of money on something that isn't proven, you know, or this yeah. even like in the case of something like splice is actually probably going to fail. <laughs> this is very dangerous. I'm, <laughs> you know, it's asking a lot. Uh, and so I feel like I've been insanely lucky, you know, mm -hmm. I think, uh there's a, there's a lot of luck in this business and yeah. um and so yeah the answer to your question is it's just but it is it's hard so it's just hard and there's no easy way to find a path you just have to like hack your way through it <laughs> and 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 i think you know in the long run now that i'm a bit older and i've been around for a while i feel like i can say with some confidence that um, those old truisms are true, which is, you know, be true to yourself, like do mm -hmm. what your heart tells you. Don't just do what's expected or what you think other people will like. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I attribute some of my longevity to that. I think that, uh, had I done a few of the things that had been given to me, maybe I, you know, if nothing else, I wouldn't be as happy with my professional career um had i done those things so yeah and then you know the other important thing good friends yes like if you especially people that you work with if you work with really great people uh you always get to the finish line somehow things always work out in the end and and the opposite is true mm -hmm. <laughs> so i think those are those and and you know and, and actually in film school i never hear anybody say this I, it's very rarely that i hear this but uh if you at all can find a good producer, you know, it doesn't have to be a famous producer. It doesn't have to be a powerful producer, but somebody who wants to produce who you really like and who understands you. 
And I've, mm -hmm. I've been lucky to have this longstanding relationship with Steve Hoban. Um, and that's protected me. You yeah. know, it, uh, it, when you're dealing, I mean, I haven't made really any studio films. It's always, everything's been independent, even if tangentially they were connected or released by studios, but I never went through that in the film world, that hardcore experience. Mm -hmm. But even then, you know, you need somebody to protect you and what you're trying to accomplish um, in that role. And if you don't have that person or that person isn't looking out for your best interests, I've seen with some other people, you know, dear friends of mine, a lot of bad things come out of that. So that's a lesson that I would impart as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, sound, it sounds like, I mean, you know, always fighting, fighting to get your voice into the project, I think is, that's that's a great uh, piece of advice because you know um because if you can leave your mark you know what with whatever you're working on and i try to do that um you know in my creative endeavors trying to leave my mark you know on on, on what I, mean, I do um i do audiobooks and and things like that so i always i'm bringing my personality into someone else's words um you know i just got done doing 14 hour, a 13 and a half hour, uh, uh, William Scholl book. It was originally entitled Spawn of Hell and they changed the name to, uh, things that go bump in the night. Um, but, um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that because I'm, I'm working with somebody else's baby <laughs> in a sense. Right. And I'm trying to honor that, but I also need uh, to stay true to who hard. I am as a storyteller in that, in, in that direction, um, in that space. But, I mean, yeah, but I've noticed everything that I've seen that you've done, you know, uh, has has had that stamp. Now, um, you now a show, you know, in, in television, a show like Hannibal, you have, show, you know, producers, showrunners, um, a little bit harder for television series um, like the the peripheral. Um, where, what for those just of, just because I'm curious <laughs> and I didn't look it up for those for Hannibal and like for the peripheral, what was kind of your, what was your involvement uh, as a, as a writer for those? Is it with a writing team? Is it, are they, you know, uh, oh. how does that work? Just cause I'm curious. Sure. Well, you know, there are various iterations of these things, but um, uh, with Hannibal, I was just a, literally a gun for hire. Like I'm just, right. I'm the substitute teacher. That's what, that's what <laughs> most TV directing is about is somebody hires you to, do an episode or several episodes and you're the variable piece. Right. The actors, the crew, they're all the same, but you're the guy who comes in. And actually my philosophy about doing that work was came from comic books because comic books generally are like TV series, you know, like whatever X-Men or something. It's the same right. characters and, and it's a serialized story and the variable well, the variable could be the writers, but but when I used to read comic books, the variable that excited me was the artist. And each artist would bring something very, very different to that book. And I, I sort of took the approach that the director on a TV show is a little bit like the artist on a comic book series. And, mm -hmm. and so I would never work against the style of the show or the intent of the show, um, but I would try very hard to a personal touch into it and not be generic mm -hmm. and and with Hannibal which was just a wonderful way to begin um uh the show was anything but generic and and Brian who brilliantly ran that show uh would fire a director if they provided generic footage like he I just one of the things the joys of working on it was and why I actually feel some of my best work as a director on, is on that show is because he would encourage, challenge you as the director to do something very, very dangerous and interesting. And, um, uh, but I was a gun for hire on it and, and I would never take credit for that show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The peripheral on the other hand was something that Steve, my producing partner and I optioned. And then we optioned because I had a, a relationship with the writer, William Gibson, um, I saw the book and, and we thought, oh, this could be a TV series. So we optioned it and, uh, and I happened to be doing Westworld at the time. So I, I brought it to Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy who run that show and they immediately responded to it. And that was that, <laughs> um, but I was not the writer. So I was involved right. throughout from the beginning 
beginning creatively and in terms of developing the material, but as, as a group and Scott Smith, um, who's a fantastic writer was the one who really broke that okay. show and, and wrote that show. So that was very much a collaboration, but I, I do take some ownership over <clears throat> the peripheral cause it was, I was, I was with it all the way. That wasn't a, right. a, a job for hire. Right. Is there any chance, is, is there any chance, can, is somebody going to save the peripheral? Come on. Is there, do you have any inside information? I don't think that's possible. <laughs> you could I, it's highly unlikely. And so, <laughs> you know, something like that, I know that happens with some shows, but yeah, that show was, was expensive and there's such yeah. a huge cast. Like to, to yeah. rebuild that, you know, a year or two yeah. later, I <laughs> don't think that could happen. <laughs> Sadly. Well, I mean, as it as it stands, it's a fantastic uh, adaptation of the peripheral. Um, I wanted to talk about you brought up William Gibson, and I wanted to talk about William Gibson and his influence on tech because you said in your introduction, you know, you you give him a lot of credit for you know. I think did you see you write something like uh, not? Did you say you ripped, you ripped him off? <laughs> <laughs> Effectively, I think I I think I said theft is one of. Or I think I said I I was inspired by him, but theft being one of the themes of the story is yeah. actually more like a more accurate description of what I did. Yeah, no, no, I I and I can stand in line because so many people have ripped off William Gibson, and when I gave him <laughs> this comic, I did it so sheepishly because I I was I did it like I was just ashamed. Um, <laughs> But he's such a sweet, sweet and generous person. He didn't seem to see it, but I know what I did. And uh, I, this owes a huge debt to him. It actually owes a huge debt, huge debt to Neuromancer because yeah. Neuromancer was a, is a book he wrote, you know, one of the great science fiction novels, most influential science fiction novels of all time that I mm -hmm. had the good fortune to adapt or attempt to adapt as a feature film. And I spent many years trying to get that made and it, and it didn't happen. And so tech is a little bit of like me, you know, getting to work that out of my system. So it, 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 I, I think, yes, I, I was a huge debt to William Gibson. I mean, we asked him to write the introduction, but I just, it was probably a terrible thing to ask him to do, but he was. <laughs> it was wonderful. I was just so happy when it came to my email and I was like, oh man, this is great. Cause I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm a sci-fi nerd. Um, I always like, you know, I love, you know, Star Wars, everything's great, but I always love science fiction with kind of a darker, um, a, a, you know, sharper edge to it. Um, Blade Runner, of course, um, movies, movies like that. I mean, the, the, the new adaptation of Dune um, is just incredible. The, that scope of storytelling done in science fiction where, you know, it's, you know, that some many of these characters prob characters probably are not safe like any of these characters that i'm really into you know may not make it to the next scene um and just mm -hmm. that you know more there's more grit i mean ridley scott's alien i think instilled that in me um and i when i first saw that i mean i was it came out in uh, you know i was too little to see in the theaters but i had heard you know stories uh, from my parents who saw in the theater uh, about about that and really that film as a science fiction film really kind of turned you know uh, just turned a corner with science fiction in general and so ever since then I, I searched you know that stuff out and, and a lot of them that sort of stuff especially in film I guess in television is hard to find you find it in graphic novels uh, you find it in, in novels mm -hmm. um, you know John Shirley is another one who uh, who did a lot of kind of really great um, science fiction, cyberpunk um, type stuff. And so those are the stuff that I always try to try to find. Um, was there any other inspirations you pulled in from from tech? Um, and you know, what? Oh, yeah, um, no, <laughs> there... <laughs> there's so much I'm, I'm taking from. I mean, <laughs> I think more than anything, what I'm taking from Mr. Gibson's work is and what I love about it is that he does everything from a street level point of view. So, you know, mm -hmm. he's dealing yeah. like he's the guy who coined the term cyberspace. So he's dealing with, you know, very heady stuff, big ideas. Um, he's always a step ahead of the curve, but it's contextualized in with the people and environments that are we all understand as regular right. folks. And 
and um, and it even tends to, you know, explore the seedy underbelly of the society too. And uh, um, so that I, I I that excites me. Like I I like I like I was excited by the idea of with tech that you know we we would be dealing with some fairly heady things, but it's all it's in this. You know, Michael Mann, you're asking me for influences. Michael Mann's a big influence. Like we're dealing with yeah. this in a Michael Mann styled heist story. So it, it really grounds everything and and it makes it feel understandable. And, you know, greed is something that we're very familiar with, especially these days yeah. as a human trait. Like there's nobody in the story except maybe ultimately Shell herself who really has ambitions much beyond just getting rich like they they're very <laughs> narrow minded and uh but it feels real right like that's that's mm -hmm. what i see when i open my news feed every day i look out the window i just see unmitigated human greed everywhere and uh so i i think that you're taking something very um conceptual and then dragging it into the street is exciting and and that, yeah. that's what he does and then yeah I, michael mann you know, like heat was something thief. I stole from thief. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and then in terms of the art itself, like I'm a big fan of Moebius, uh, whose real name is Jean Giraud, uh, Inke Bilal, yeah. um, Frank Miller, who his Ronin comics were very, these are things that are like in my DNA. I, yeah. And I spent, they were so important to me growing up and later in life as well. Uh, so I, I do feel like tech is kind of a blender of a whole bunch of things, probably many of which I'm not even conscious of. Right. Yeah. We, we all, we all kind of do that when we create things where there's stuff in our subconscious that we have just absorbed through, uh, and especially, you know, people like us who just consume, <laughs> uh, different types of media and film and, and stories. I mean, stories, I think are the big, I'm, I'm a collector of stories. So whether it's you know interviews um documentaries movie film books you know all that kind of stuff um you know i just can't get enough of it and uh that that definitely informs things that i get involved in um and i'm sure that's the same for any creative out there and any any author i mean any author any any filmmaker we all have those influences that drive us you know to make the things that we're excited about um yeah, it, and you just hope that like it's not a pastiche. Like what you what I hope with this is that there is there is kind of alchemy going on. So it unabashedly is influenced by many many things, but that when put together and kind of filtered through whatever I got, um, right. it does become its own thing. Like it has its own identity, and um, I hope. But, uh, last it it does. Say. No, I mean. Tech turned out, I think, more than I had imagined it would be when I first heard about it. It is there's it hits on so many. Whoops, I'm bumping my thing. Um, there's so many, like I've like I said, so many layers to it. It's not just this wham bam action sci-fi thing. There's so much uh, beneath the surface um, to it that it makes me. You know, I want to grab it and read and see what I missed, you know, because there is even in the images, there's so much subtext to everything. And and um, the artwork is there. The artwork is absolutely beautiful. And I love that you play with color throughout, um, you know, and you you when we we'd, um, had some back and forths and talking about the colors of it, where it does start off, you know, a bit monochromatic. But as the story goes along, as as Shell starts realizing things about you know herself, uh, it, there's moments where it's just this vivid imagery, and there's some spreads on that full page of just incredible uh, imagery, you know, and colors. It's it's absolutely fantastic, and you know, in my mind, I'm like, I would love to see this on a screen, uh, but then, <laughs> but it, but would it be animated? And oh, that'd be expensive. <laughs> so we, I'm I'm glad that we have this. Uh, I'm glad that we have this in book form um, and 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 digital. We finally got it up there on, yeah, <laughs> on Amazon digital. That's a whole new uh, new ball game for us. We're trying to figure that out, but um, you know, it 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 deserves to be you know just absorbed 
and uh, I, I really do love it. Um, I want to transition to talking about the novelizations while I still have you here that, that mm -hmm. we, um, and that was the first thing I ever you know talked to you about was doing adaptations of cube and adaptations of, uh, of splice and um, cube is still being written. So I'm not going to announce anything about that other than the, we got two amazing covers all ready to go. <laughs> but, um, but so cube, I'll have a little bit of, um, it's about halfway done. Um, it's the same thing. This is an, an author who has a day job uh, in Los Angeles and, and writing, you know, on their, you know, when they can. And so it just, things take a little bit longer um, on it, but it's uh, according to Mark turning out fantastic uh, so far. So I can't wait to I'm showcase excited. that one, but um, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the adaptation of splice. Um, Claire Donner is the author. And when we were kind of figuring out who, you know, could write it, we have, we always have kind of a running list of authors and, and, and people that we've worked with that we know of and we're kind of always keeping an eye on and try to, I try to match once we get a deal, I try to match up a couple authors with the property based on what I know about them, see if they, they're a match. Um, I really can't wait for people to read Splice because I think that Claire did such a wonderful job of really elevating uh, the story and the characters hmm. even more than you could in a film. And that's the beauty about novels is you can dive into, you know, uh, somebody's motivations, their inner, inner dialogues and things like that. Um, what were a couple of the things that you noticed that Claire did to elevate splice, you know, um, in, in your mind from, from say the film, what, what were things that really surprised you that she did? Well, it's everything you said. So I, for anyone doesn't get it, I've read Splice uh, and the novelization. I think it's great. And I, I, and I wrote you guys about that, but I, mm -hmm. uh, and to Claire, um, who I didn't know before this, but who I think is really terrific and yeah. so well researched um, because she, you know, we did a lot of research when we made the film Splice. I spent time in genetics labs and I got to know a bunch of geneticists and a few of them are in the movie. Um, uh, uh, but I could see that Claire had done her homework too. So there's just a, a level of technical authenticity that I thought was, that she brought to it that was beyond what was in the film. And then exactly as you've said, I think her understanding of and appreciation of those characters was really deep. Like mm -hmm. I, 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 I can't help because, you know, I co-wrote that script. I'm very connected <laughs> to Clive and Elsa's characters. I've thought about them a lot. And I think that she was making observations that I hadn't thought of. Like I think in mm. some ways, you know, she went even further and 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 in sort of exploring their inner world and a little bit of their past that we don't get to see in the film, um, she makes them that much more appealing and 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 complicated. And uh, and that includes Dren, <laughs> the hybrid, who has an inner yeah. monologue as well and a perspective as well. Um, and uh, and I just I'm very sensitive to prose. I think you know when when I come across something where I don't feel an elegance <laughs> to the writing, I it bothers me. Um, right. She's a very fine writer. I I love her prose. I think she's very efficient. But there is a there is some poetry going on as well, and you know one of my favorite writers is uh, J. G. Ballard, um, who you know wrote many great books, but probably is most famous for having written Empire of the Sun, which Spielberg made into a movie, or Crash, mm -hmm. Cronenberg made into a film. Um, but he has a and he would have had an influence, I think, on on Splice, um, in so much as he has he'll take something that's very morally aberrant or strange and he won't judge it he'll mm -hmm. he'll describe it in a rather clinical detached way that has poetry to it it's a weird kind of dichotomy of something is both um almost like uh reading uh, a science textbook and is poetic at the same time it finds the poetry in that kind of clinical language and i think Claire was playing with that as well. It was really appropriate for the splice story. So um, 
uh, yeah, I, th I think she was a superb choice. I can't imagine anyone. Better. Awesome. 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 I will have to have, uh, when we get closer, I want, I'll have to have you and Claire on, um, I'd love to talk in depth about splice and, and the novelization. Um, so we are about to send it to a, an editor, um, and to kind of finalize everything, get it, uh, get an, an editor's eyes on it. And, um, it already has the Vincenzo seal of approval. So I, that, 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 when you wrote back no notes, I was like, come on, Vincenzo, you have no notes. <laughs> come on, man. Um, but that's from from because we really do. Uh, we handle these novelizations. We really respect them. We want to respect the the source. And um, and we but we also do love it when an author can inject themselves or that their voice uh, into the the novelization as well as kind of bring some new perspectives in there. And this one um, is a very special one. I'm very, very pleased with it so far. So we'll get an, an, an editor on it and, uh, you know, get it, uh, you know, proofread and formatted. And I'm hoping, uh, looking at, and we're hoping for early, you know, early quarter, quarter one, you know, January, February, we'll have right. it all ready to go and you'll have copies in your hands. So uh, I'm very excited about that. Cube a little way ways off. I'm hoping for summertime. Um, so we're gonna keep the Vincenzo train rolling, and you even have an idea for nothing, which I'm totally gonna look into. So okay, we'll keep I'm that, so we'll keep that, that for we'll keep that under wraps, but uh, we won't expand on that. But yeah, when you mentioned what you were thinking about with with nothing, I was um, very pleased because this is the kind of stuff we love. We love playing with being able to play in someone else's sandbox, I guess, <laughs> but also honor that and, you know, have, have fun with it. And, and, uh, and that's the great thing about art and about stories is there's, you can, you can read or watch the same story multiple times in different, you know, different formats and still get something new out of it. And uh, that's really something that we love to do over here at Encyclopocalypse is uh, you know, bring, I... bring stories out. I love books and I love novelizations. I have respect for them I, when they're well done. You know, I think they can be really great. And I, uh, when there's a movie that has a world, that builds a world that I want to go back, back into, that's mm -hmm. when I want these ancillary things. Like, you know, Alien being, yeah, I think a perfect example of like, you just felt when you saw that film, um, you knew there was more going on mm -hmm. than what there was there was depth to that story and that wasn't fully explored in the movie um nor should it have been but right but we knew there was a story behind the space jockey and we knew the all there there is such the design of it and the the sort of underlying architecture of how they constructed both the human universe and the aliens world um was so deep that you just wanted to go deeper and yeah. if you ever read the alan dean foster novelization of that film it's great because it offers more than is in the film and you, it allows you to like in a kind of vr sense walk mm -hmm. deeper into corridors of an ostromo that you had never seen before so i feel like the splice novelization does that and i really yeah i love it i think and i love i'm I love books. I like material things, physical yeah. things. And when they're beautifully, you know, when they have great covers and so on, which I think you guys, uh, your, your covers are amazing. Uh, and I can feel that you're having fun making this stuff. Like I see yeah. how sincere and how much you are about it, how much pleasure you guys take from it. Uh, it's very special. If if I find myself giggling as I'm formatting a cover, I just, I know I'm on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I don't, I don't draw the covers, but I can take, I take the artwork, compile it, you know, uh, put it all together, play around with the titling. And when I get something there, I just laugh. Uh, I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on the right track. Um, I just did uh, Commando Ninja. I was able to use, it's a U YouTube <laughs> sensation, Commando Ninja. It's like a, a 60 minute YouTube uh, uh, movie. And we're going to be, we're putting out a special edition of, of the uh of the novelization that brian barry wrote he 
he he brokered that deal himself. He put out the trade version, and I was like, "Can we get a? Can we do a special edition?" So when I was putting that together, you know, with the with the original co uh, poster art, it was just, and then and then getting things lined up, and then you get it, you you get something that, you know, to uh, emulate what you're trying to do. Just it's just a fantastic feeling, and mm -hmm. yeah, I I find myself uh, enjoying and laughing and loving, you know, what we're doing. Uh, we work with really incredible artists, incredible authors. Um, and it's just, it's just a joy to, to be, to be doing this. Um, we are, we are about out of time, but I wanted to give, ev give you a chance to, um, let everyone know, is there anything that you're working on or, you know, uh, you know, anything you can tell everyone about that you are looking forward to or have releasing or anything like that? It's tech, tech, tech. It's just tech. tech. Okay. All right. <laughs> I've been, my All industry right. has been on strike for six months. I know. So, uh, I know. But you know, there's we're gearing up. I hope. I, I mean, I have a film. <laughs> I have actors for it. If I can get some right. money together, I'll be shooting this right. year. Right. Um, so there's lots in the works, you know. But it's uh, he's got to he's got to be patient. Be. Oh, you know, the one thing I'll mention, for what it's worth, for anyone who's interested, is I I have done this like very, I don't know self-indulgent thing, but I have a website that's just my name. I think it's vincenzo Natalicom but um, it's like an archive, a digital archive. Yeah, of oh man, it's so All good. of my films and my TV work and stuff and, and other stuff. And it, it's just basically like, I have just all this stuff on my computer. I was like, I, I, I hate having not just my artwork, but like artwork from other really, really great artists that I worked with that nobody ever sees. Um, and the scripts and all that stuff. So, so yeah, I would like to promote that. Anyone who's interested can go there. Everything's available. Awesome. It's a beautiful site. There's, it's a treasure drove. Uh, so, such, so much good stuff on there. <clears throat> and that's kind of how we uh, decided to decide on the, the mass market size covers for Splice and for Q because you had a, um, a poster done, kind of a fan poster. Um, is it Alex? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher his name, the artist. Uh, that he did of Cube. What was the artist? Alexi. 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 And he did, it wasn't commissioned by me. He just did, I think, on his own for fun, a Cube poster that's yeah. so beautiful and graphic. And like, yeah, it's just a very, so and, he, and then by, again, by coincidence, or I don't know what, he did a poster for my version of Neuromancer for a book about movies oh. that were never made, which is really amazing. Um, so that's how I had, knew about him and kind of connected with him yeah yeah and then he's it's, done it's one so for the good book, so it's yeah so he did the uh, same style as as cube it's so good i can't wait to show it off um it's beautiful and it's something that i, mean, I told him i'm like print man get these ready and get ready to sell some posters because this is a, a beautiful beautiful piece of art um yeah so so good but um all right well uh tech is out i should show the cover for P our, our youtube viewers here's here's the cover hopefully it's right side so hopefully it's uh not mirrored yeah, good. but um <laughs> it's right there it's beautiful it's beautiful beautiful and um <laughs> i i love it uh absolutely love it i loved working on it i loved the, the formatting work that i did was just a, just a joy um to do and um, working oh. with with you, Vincenzo, on on this has been just a dream, and uh, you know it's it's funny. I never thought when I originally re reached out to you that we would uh, we would ever we would be sitting here chatting about your movies and and a, a graphic novel that you created. It's it's been a, a real pleasure. <laughs> I did not see that coming, but I'm so happy it did. It's just been great. It, you know, when I I I, w I won't say who it is, but I know a very well known screenwriter who's done some very high level films, including some big science fiction movies, uh, who had written some comic books. And he said, be prepared to be disappointed <laughs> because these companies, <laughs> they just like, I'm always underwhelmed. And that didn't happen. You guys have been great. It's I've out. A, it's available. Great experience. You can grab it over at, uh, and I did this so you don't have to type out our name at buyhorrorbooks.com. I know this isn't a horror novel. But buyhorrorbooks.com is the easiest way to find uh, find our site. Of course, if you Google Tech and Vincenzo, you'll find plenty of places to grab it. Barnes & Noble, Amazon, um, anywhere that sells books should have it. Um, I need to check on the Canadian stores. I know that it's available on Amazon there. 
Um, and I need to just kind of follow up with there's other um, bookstores in, in Canada that want to follow up on a mixture that's populating there. But that's always, a, you know, it's always a circular race with me trying to track to make sure the book's showing up or should be. But uh, Vincenzo, again, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I mean, you and I will be talking soon. And uh, but I look yeah. forward to the next time we chat on this on this uh, podcast. We'll have Claire with us talking about splice yeah. and it should be a very good time. Oh, I'd really like that. And uh, all of you watching and listening, thank you so much um, for the people watching right now. It sh- I'll have the, the audio version up at some point uh, this this weekend. And uh, you can listen to it that way. You can always, uh, again, go over to buyhorrorbooks.com, find out more about us. And uh, I will talk to all of you next time. Bye.